Ethiopia has accused Egypt and other enemies of being behind the violence, which has disturbed the peace in the country for about 25 years now. Addis Ababa officials insinuate that Egypt has a hand in the financing and training of the protesters described by the Ethiopian government as terrorists. Groups and individuals which our country describe as terrorists, like the Oromo Liberation Front and the Jinbot 7, work hand in hand with Egyptian institutions and are responsible for the recent destruction in our country. The property of many foreign investors has been destroyed and their employees injured. It is not clear what interest Egypt could have causing instability in Ethiopia, but Egyptian officials are yet to speak about the accusations leveled against them by Ethiopia. Last weekend, protesters from the Oromo region destroyed buildings and enterprises owned by foreigners. The destruction pushed the Ethiopian government to declare a six months state of emergency. Hundreds of protesters marched along the streets of Burundi's capital Bujumbura on Saturday over a UN report released on Tuesday accusing the Burundian government of carrying out human rights abuses. Waving placards, the protesters marched past the UN officers in the capital denouncing the report. Even if they release more reports that are far from the truth, I will still stand as an elected official and together with the people, I will still protest and dismiss the reports. The report indicated that the Burundian government had committed gross human rights violations in some cases amounting to crimes against humanity. Everything that has been done in Burundi, of all the reports which have been released in this case, the investigation report of the Attorney General, you will not find anything. There is a testimony of some of the young people who have testified to the media or on national television, but there is no truth there. Therefore, they have brought together the elements of the radical opposition. <laughs> Responding to the United Nations, Burundi's government said that the UN is biased and that the investigators were politically motivated and their conclusions were based on anonymous and unverifiable sources. And more destruction of property continue at some universities across South Africa as some institutions forge ahead with the fees must fall protests. A no-go area at this TUT campus. Entrances at the Pretoria West campus barricaded with burning tires. Staff at both the Kharangua and Pretoria campuses were told to go home. Management had earlier said that classes would be up and running today but for now the campus remains closed. Students have moved into the Pretoria CBD. Academic activities brought to a halt. This as violence broke out at the Mahikeng campus of the Northwest University. <laughs> Students and management are accusing police of being heavy-handed in quelling the violence. The police are, are continuing to shoot the, the you know, whatever shots, uh, it's not live ammunition obviously, to students who are inside the residences. Uh, why is that? Several students have been arrested in the ensuing violence. Police gained access into student residences firing rubber bullets and stun grenades. But students retaliated by pelting police with stones. Our campus is military, is militarized. Our campus is symbolizing apartheid at, it, at its core. A trail of destruction. The main entrance to the CPUT as well as the control center also set alight. Charges of attempted murder were laid after protesters locked two security guards in this building while it was burning. The guards are said to have suffered mostly smoke inhalation injuries. The institution says they are in a stable condition. Other charges laid include public violence and malicious damage to property. A group of small protesters have gathered at the Witz Great Hall under the watchful eye of police. This is lectures continue. A catch-up program is already underway at the University of Limpopo. This follows a two-week shutdown prompted by violent protests. This is the second university in the province to reopen its doors this week. The University of Venda resumed on Monday. 
Student leaders are still demanding free education but promise to refrain from violence. They, however, want police and security personnel out of the varsity premises. So we're now joined by Anne-Marie McCoy. She is in New Providence in the Bahamas. What can you tell us about Hurricane Matthew and how it treated Bahamas? The Bahamas has gotten a big lashing from Hurricane Matthew. At this moment, it is moving from here to Grand Bahama, which is probably going to be getting the full eye of it. It has left a lot of homes in the Bahamas. People had to move to higher grounds. Police and soldiers had to remove some people because they refused us to move before the hurricane, and they were told to do so, such as in the South Beach area, Sea Breeze, and St. Andrew Beach Estate. Anything to do with up east, most places are flooded, and a lot of people, even on the lower line, have been flooded, such as Pinewood Gardens, right inside Nassau here, and many other areas have been suffering terribly. A lot of power lines are down, a lot of trees are down, the windows that people batten up, I am standing right before looking at one house, so two of the, the um, boards have been cast off, a lot of shingles are off the homes. It is devastating. It is devastating. I, it's going to be a long recovery, trust me, it is not easy. As it is where I am, there is no falling power lines, but a lot of power lines have been falling other places. But they could not keep the power on because of the strength of Hurricane Matthew, which was Category 4. Now, in terms of the shelters, so, have, you, have you had any reports yet in respect of the shelters and how they stood up? Uh, uh, one place, the roof for the shelter was completely taken off and they had to evacuate the people to somewhere else. And the shelters here are over flooded. They are full to capacity. It's, it ain't no easy joke right here in Nassau, Bahamas. New Providence, it's not easy. It is early days yet, but in respect of food supplies and the availability of food and critical things like water, do you have any sense mm -hmm. as to whether there is adequate supplies of those critical commodities? I would say yes. I think food supply is adequate. How is it going to do after this effect now when everybody's food is running out? I don't know because the Bahamas depends on the boats to come from Miami in America to supply them with their goods for food store. And like we would say in Jamaica, St. Elizabeth is a bread basket. Now they have a par, um, an island called Andrews. They call it the big yard. That's where the Bamzi agricultural place is. And they have taken a big lick and they have got it. To, it's something to talk about. And Marie McCoy, thank you so very much. Hurricane Matthew unleashed torrential rains and fierce winds as it hugged the Florida coast Friday after a blast through the Caribbean. Evacuation orders were issued for areas covering some 3 million residents and major U.S. cities such as Jacksonville, Florida and Savannah, Georgia, which lay in the path of the storm. Highways in those cities were jammed with people streaming inland to escape the storm forecast to be strong enough to snap trees and blow away roofs or entire houses. While passing on the outskirts of Jamaica, Matthew dumped heavy rains on the island Sunday, flooding several communities and city roads within minutes of the downpour. The storm caused havoc on Tuesday as it hit Haiti's southern coast, killing more than 400 people according to a senator from the region. Matthew also devastated the historic colonial town of Baracoa in eastern Cuba and hurled large rocks onto the roads cutting off a total of four towns, authorities and residents said.